Good morning from Washington, D.C. I am Karen Donfried with GMF, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to this conversation with Slovakia's foreign minister, Ivan Korchuk, this morning. Now, I am delighted to welcome the minister for two reasons. One is he is one of Europe's most thoughtful foreign ministers, and he brings to this position a wealth of experience over 30 years. Most recently, he served as Slovakia's ambassador, ambassador to the United States, and I will come back to that a bit later. Prior to that, he served as State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. And before that, he was government plenipotentiary for the Slovak presidency in the Council of the EU. He also served as Slovakia's ambassador to the European Union, as well as Slovak ambassador to Germany. So you can see the tremendous experience he brings to his current position. The second reason why I am delighted to welcome the minister this morning is precisely because of his role previously as Slovak ambassador to the US. I had the great privilege and pleasure of getting to know him well when he was in that role. He was a terrific partner to GMF and even traveled out to Denver, Colorado with us. Right. So I got to see him at work with Americans and his deep interest in the United States. And I also saw the finesse he brought to transatlantic relations and the priority he gives to that relationship. So for those reasons, it truly is my pleasure to welcome to the GMF virtual platform, Slovakia's foreign minister today. And with that, I'm gonna hand the baton to my wonderful colleague, Jonathan Katz, who will moderate the conversation with the minister. So a very warm welcome to you, Mr. Korchuk, and Jonathan, over to you. Great, Karen, thank you so much. And, um, uh, echo all all the all the thoughts that you uh, have raised about the foreign minister's leadership, um, um, and I want to welcome the foreign minister to to this conversation today, and uh, you know, and to welcome all those on both sides of the Atlantic who have joined uh, for this conversation. And I just want to say, uh, you know, Slovakia has become this real leading voice uh, in Europe, one for transatlantic unity and cooperation, but also for democracy. And the foreign minister. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, you've been at the lead uh, talking about these issues, uh, both in the context of, of, of what's happening in the EU, but also across the Atlantic with the United States. Uh, and you're, you're uh, meeting, and meeting with uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in October was a very positive moment, an extraordinary moment for bilateral relations and having signed a, a strategic dialogue and a joint declaration on 5G security so it's really great to have you here and, and to have you join us. Uh, before we, you know, before we jump in, uh, there was, we, we hope you could start us off with, uh, with uh, you know, just responding to a, a question. Um, and I think we're obviously in the middle of our own transition in, in Washington. And, uh, and uh, obviously there's a lot happening in Europe as well, including on, on issues like COVID-19 response. Um, and other deep challenges. But we wanted to ask you, since we, we're so uh, lucky to have you here today, is to ask you about uh, you know, what you see as the key foreign policy challenges and opportunities you see in Europe and globally that need immediate attention and cooperation, including COVID-19, um, and, and maybe talk about it from the perspective of Slovakia um, and sort of the US and, and transatlantic partners. Uh, there's obviously some key security challenges. Russia and China fit onto that agenda, uh, but we also know that there's issues of of democracy, and uh, and uh, and of course, uh, one thing that I, I'd want to raise with you too is this concept of a democracy summit. And since you've been a leading voice speaking about these issues, uh, the incoming administration, President-elect Biden, has talked greatly about this issue of strengthening democracy and focusing 
on strengthening transatlantic relations, something that uh, Karen Donfrey, GMF have, have been involved in um, uh, not only just recently, but for the last several decades, uh, directly working on these issues. So if I could just turn to you for an opening statement and yeah. uh, just for the, for, for the audience of those who are participating, uh, this is a Zoom event. So please feel free to pose questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A uh, sort of box, there's a, at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the Q&A uh, ability to do that. So please pose your questions. Uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, &A session after uh, the foreign minister speaks. But first, I wanted to just turn it over to the foreign minister. We have so many, so many questions, so many issues to touch on in such little time. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to join uh, GMF and this audience today. So over to you, foreign minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Jonathan. Uh, thank uh, you all for having me. I'd like to say how, how much I appreciate my relationship and a close cooperation that we've been having in Slovakia with GMF over the many, many years, decades, actually. And two, I'm still thinking about my recent time that I've spent in the United States in a very close relationship, which I have had with GMF in Washington DC and with uh, with you, Karen. You're right, I will never forget the, the, the very short trip that you have prepared for me and you, you took me to Denver, Colorado. I can tell you and the viewers, I have never ever experienced such a packed uh, program that you have prepared for me. Those were, I literally remember those were 12 meetings in one day, including three public uh, public speeches that we were supposed to deliver. So I was completely, you know, destroyed after that. But that remains uh, in my in my memory as something very, very valuable that GMF is doing with the international community in in Washington, D.C. And by that, the GMF is creating really platform for us Europeans, especially to talk about transatlantic relations after, after all, I said a few words about that uh, as well. Jonathan, before I share with you, maybe a, with a few remarks, our Slovak priorities, which I want to put in a more broader context, because I don't want to bother you and the audience or the listeners <clears throat> by our specific Slovak issues, I'd like to start off with uh, two remarks. The first one, these are extremely difficult times we are, we are living. I mean, in the United States, in Slovakia, in Europe, around the world. In fact, I've been in this office now for eight months, but we are a COVID government. All governments around the world are dealing with that. But imagine that we were sworn in as a government right when at, at the outset of this crisis back in March. And in fact, I realize every day that the Slovak citizens that have given a very, very strong mandate to our government, we have constitutional majority, we have a mandate to change the country for the better, that those people are just, you know, experiencing their own government, which is constantly since day one in a crisis management. And this is extremely, extremely difficult because instead of focusing really what people have been, you know, voting for when they've given us their, their votes, we are completely consumed by the unpopular measures that we have to introduce. And still, as we speak in, 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 in Slovakia, we are experiencing the, in fact, the, the record increase every day in the numbers of, of people who are infected in Slovakia. It's incredible. We are struggling with that. We have even, uh, I think, worldwide um, introduced an experiment of uh, nationwide testing. We've done that. But, you know, we have experienced as well why it helped a lot. Now we know that you could only basically uh, use that if you do it repeatedly, the nationwide testing. But this is impossible for, for political reasons, for structural reasons, how, logistical reasons. So we are struggling with that. And, and two, politically, it is extremely difficult because in this time of Advent and, you know, when people are now focused on Christmas and instead of giving people a hope, we are distributing to people measures that we have to introduce as a, as a, as a lockdown. So, you know, on the 21st, we are introducing a lockdown in Slovakia. So talking about foreign policy, about extremely important issues that, you know, 
that matter for the two sides on the, uh, of the Atlantic, whether we like it or not, we are completely consumed by, by COVID. So that's number one. Number two, having said all that, uh, and this is, this is very depressing uh, time uh, that we are experiencing. We still at the end of this week are experiencing, so to say, a good, good news as well. And that's the outcome of a uh, European Council or the summit of, of the leaders, which has just finished, I think, a few hours ago. And I believe we can be really proud of us who have delivered on our promise to introduce or to put on the table a very uh, heavy economic instrument. And that's the agreement on budget for seven years. And that's also an agreement on so-called recovery fund because now we are focused on COVID and you know, the protection of health and all the consequences, but we are in, in the middle of an economic crisis. And I think we, we really can be satisfied uh, over our own ability as a European Union to deliver exactly on this, how to you know, challenge, how to face this economic uh, crisis, unprecedented package of financial Mm, financial support for the European economy uh, was agreed, uh, almost 2 billion uh, US dollars. In addition, in addition, another outcome, very important, I think, for the world, not only for us Europeans and Americans, but for the world, that we have agreed to increase the reduction target, so to say, when it comes to emissions. So the climate policy of European Union is very ambitious. We have made his decision to increase it from 40% compared to 1990 to, uh, to 55%. So it's a very, I think, bold decision that we have just taken a few hours ago uh, that Europeans are really continuing in their leadership role when it comes to the measures that we want to introduce to, to deal with, uh, with uh, climate change. So very good. And, and thirdly, maybe Jonathan, you will, you will come to that later on. Well, we have sent a strong signal uh, that basically the, the principle of rule of law, uh, which is the very basis of, uh, of democracy, I mean, in, in our nationally in, in our countries in the United States, but equally uh, in the European Union, uh, is not negotiable. As you know, there was a veto, uh, and we, we needed some more clarification, but finally, the outcome of this is once again that, that rule of law is something that you cannot uh, that you cannot negotiate, and it remains in the center of um, of, of European Union, and it is very much uh, linked also to the funds that the European Union will provide to its uh, member states. So that was on COVID, good news from European Council, and number three. Jonathan, you have outlined a whole list of issues and I can endlessly talk about them, but I will take just one. And that's, uh, that's the one that I've been many times discussing with, uh, with Karen. And that's the uh, opportunity, I think, uh, which comes now with the new administration, an opportunity to renew uh, and restore uh, transatlantic uh, bonds. This is for me, maybe one of the the most important issues uh, for our community, transatlantic community, but nationally from our position in Slovakia, in Slovakia uh, as well. I will in this introduction just throw two or three points, uh, which I believe or is so this is my take uh, uh, when it comes to transatlantic relationship and what should be done in order to restore transatlantic uh, relations and improve them. And then we can, of course, discuss that. So first, I believe in order to not to come where we were um, back in the 90s and including in, 20, in 2016 and, and earlier, but to, to open really a new chapter, the first precondition for me is to understand on both sides of Atlantic, but more, even more on the American side, that uh, the the old perspective of transatlantic relations being composed of bilateral track and NATO track is overcome. You have to add to it a very distinctive and specific relationship 
uh, between the United States and European Union. The, the problem that we are having, and we've been having, not only during uh, the Trump administration, but even earlier, is that we've been too much focused on bilateral track, on NATO, and that's absolutely uh, appropriate. And NATO, by the way, is better off than it was many years ago. That's, that's, that's my, uh, my conviction. But without really um, establishing a very close relationship between the United States and European Union, we have no chance of improving transatlantic relations. I can come back to it. So that's the first precondition for me if we really want to make a difference this time and not just to repeat the mantras about transatlantic relationship. Number two, I believe we have reached the point in transatlantic relations and globally, where we have to once again start off by reassuring ourselves what is the purpose, a common purpose of this bond? What is it actually? I'm asking everybody because, you know, there's so many people who, so many people who, who believe it's trade, it's political, it's defined, it's all that. No, I think we have reached the moment because of our because of development recent developments of our relations but because of global developments as well where we make clear that the most important objective of our endeavor to to strengthen this bond is to preserve what i call political west this is at stake i believe and we all must reassure ourselves that when dealing with trade, it's going to be difficult. When dealing with issues, you know, like regulation, regulatory matters, when it comes to defense, and you can continue, we must not lose sight of the uh, most important objective, and that is to protect what has made us strong after Second World War. Once again, this is what I call, in a nutshell, to preserve political West. And political West, for me, is the type of governance rule of law and liberal international order because both of them are at stake and i close it by that so that's the second point the third point we finally need to uh, start talking to each other whether you like it or not but over recent years there, there was a dialogue but that was mainly a well-established dialogue within nato which is absolutely key and important on a, on a ministerial level, there were many bilateral, many bilateral exchanges and, and, and visits, including Slovak prime minister visiting uh, the President Trump. That's all fine. But we have not been talking to each other about strategic issues regularly and on a political level. What do I mean by that? For example, is it is it bearable for the future that we, we basically between the United States and European Union have not been having a regular meetings between your US Secretary of State and Foreign Affairs Council, that means us foreign ministers, we must change the practice where basically there was an ad hocery. So there was there were ad hoc meetings when Secretary of State was flying around the world and basically in order not to waste time during the layover, you know, <laughs> in Europe, he, you know, he, he, he met with the Foreign Affairs Council. We need to establish this, this regular dialogue about strategically important, important issues. I said the other, the other day uh, when we discussed uh, what the European Union would like to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis United States, I said, is it completely science fiction that we European foreign ministers or foreign affairs council, if you want, would travel at least on an annual basis once per year to Washington DC to meet with secretary of state. We are traveling always in the margins of European, of European nations, you know, uh, UN general assembly. But why is it, I mean, impossible to agree on US secretary of state every year traveling maybe back to back with nato and meet and we can travel to to washington dc we, we we i think without establishing this this regular dialogue we will not 
uh, we will not um, prevent us from what I've seen that by not talking to each other, we were surprising each other. And then the you know positions were, were drifting apart. And very last point, uh, I believe while we at the very outset could come an appropriate forum how to recommit ourselves to common purpose, what I've said, political West, but two, I believe very early we should put on the table the most contentious issues in our agenda, because by not talking about them, we will just be circumventing them, we will be pushing them ahead of us. And as an opening gambit for me, uh, when it comes to those important issues, would be three of them. Mm, number one, it is trade, in my view. We need to be courageous enough to at least agree on a on a common ambition, you know. So what what is it between where we are now? Uh, this is, you know, tariffs on on steel and aluminium and and protective measures and and you can you can name it. So that's the one, and a very over ambitious goal which we've abandoned uh, in between transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnerships. So we have to agree on something and then work together on it. Because if we, if we do not set an agenda for us um, in the area of trade, we are depriving ourselves of a very strong instrument, um, which creates jobs. Let me put this this way. Number two, when it comes to the issues which I believe need to be put on the table very early uh, with the Biden administration is, I mean, is to clarify what we Europeans mean by strategic sovereignty. You know, this has, this has become a very irritating issue. I know it uh, from, from my time in, in Washington, we were not able to explain across the Atlantic what we mean by that. And I think it's more for us to explain. I believe, I believe in that. And number three, I believe it's Iran. Uh, because, you know, uh, when we hear indications about uh, readiness or consideration on the Biden administration to rejoin that, I, th I think we Europeans should, should not believe that that's the end of the whole, you know, effort vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, but that would be the beginning of it. And we have to be prepared together once again uh, to work on a strategy because JCPOA was, was uh, uh, we believe, uh, was, was not perfect, but was a good framework and the US was part of it. Uh, when it comes back once again, however, I don't think that's the end of it. I'll stop here, Jonathan, because, you know, and please, yeah. with my next interventions, interrupt me because if, I, if no, I, no, my I think, intervention I think, is too long, then just jump into, into my, you know, no, screen. That was, that, was, that was great. And, and one thing I did want to go back to is what you started off with, which was, was COVID-19. Uh, COVID and I remember seeing the pictures of the new government, um, you know, you guys in Bratislava coming in with masks on and... Uh, and uh, you know, sort of saying to myself, wouldn't like you know, it's difficult enough coming in with a new administration, but under those circumstances, um, extraordinarily difficult. And I will say this: that I think on the U.S. side, particularly sort of the incoming administration, is also laser-like focused on this issue, and we are having our own challenges, uh, you know, in Washington, coming up with relief packages, proper responses, and. Uh, and, uh, and we see, you know, sort of devastating numbers on a daily basis. So our heart goes out to Slovaks impacted by this as well. Um, and hopefully that will always remain at the top of our agenda with European partners and how to not only address the current situation, uh, but the economic and post-pandemic world that we're going to find ourselves in. And I, I think that that's certainly a priority for, I know, for the, the incoming administration as well. But I, di I didn't want to sort of leave that because I remember seeing those pictures and just, uh, uh, you know, it was striking, really striking to see. Um, but also, I just wanted to just come back. Thank you for sharing, you know, sort of talking about uh, this issue of transatlantic unity.
which I wanted to sort of hopefully we can build on. I can see we have a number of questions and we had some questions that came in before the event. A lot of them dealt with this issue of transatlantic unity. Um, uh, but one, one of the questions that came that, that has come up to is, is the internal EU challenges. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the EU overcoming, you mentioned uh, this budget, um, you know, the budget deal uh, you know, a seven-year budget deal. By the way, in the United States, it would be a, it's a, it's tough enough to get a one-year budget in place um, <laughs> on an annual basis. Tougher to get something that that sort of that far far-reaching and and sort of into the future. But I wanted to ask you about this because I think uh, on the on the tr on the U.S. side too, there's often uh, sort of looking at at the EU and seeing that perhaps there's a lack of consensus internally. Um, and that includes even in your immediate neighborhood as it related to this, mm -hmm. to this budget or issues of rule of law. Uh, so issues of economic cohesion, cooperation, yeah. um, in this case, recovery. But um, can you maybe just talk about, you know, how do you see the EU moving forward, you know, overcoming, yeah. you know, the, these obstacles? Because I think the transatlantic unity partnership side relies on if, you, if, you're, if you want the EU to, you know, and I, I agree with you. It's, 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 it's far along, far beyond time for the U.S. to have a more strategic dialogue with the EU, mm -hmm. not just on paper, you know, something much more significant. But I do think that there is a view from Washington at times when you look at the EU, that there's splits and differences. And of course, Brexit is still, yeah. is still unresolved. So maybe yeah. if you could just speak to this, because I, I think it will matter to the, you know, I think the thought leaders and others who are working here saying, hey, how do we work with the EU? We want to do this, yeah. but how do, we do, how do we do it with the EU in 2021 and, and going forward? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So th this is a one million, you know, question uh, that, that, because absolutely when I'm, and I knew it, it's very risky and maybe, maybe, yes, yes, very risky when I'm calling for, so to say, strategic dialogue between the United States and European Union. But I know that immediately you and Washington and the United States will ask, but yeah, what is it, the, the dialogue? Because there are 27 nations, we don't know what it, what it is. When commissioner speaks, when the president, we have three presidents, commission and parliament and European council, then you have 27 ministers. I know that once you, the United States, uh, open yourselves to such a kind of dialogue, then the problem starts on our side because we, we have to organize ourselves. But I, I want to get us under pressure on the European, European side. Mm because we, we need to do something with, with our common foreign and security policy, which I believe is the, mo the, the least developed or the underdeveloped out of all policies. We have common monetary policy in the, in the Eurozone. We have internal market, we, you can name it, but we still have, you know, so to say 20th century uh, kind of for common foreign and security policy. So I know when I'm calling for that dialogue, it will require a lot of work on, on our uh, European European side. Now, Jonathan, you're asking about European European Union. Where, where should I start? I'm asking myself with that, because indeed, um, indeed, the EU has been not now in COVID, but for many years in a, in a, in a difficult situation. In fact, I still remember my time when I came to uh, serve in Brussels as, a, as ambassador to the EU uh, back in 2009. And in fact, since then, we've been in a constant crisis management in, in European Union. It all, it all started 2009. Some remember we were not able to agree on the constitutional, uh, constitutional treaty. Uh, then we resolved it in a way. And then immediately, uh, the EU almost fell apart, or at least the Eurozone almost fell apart because of the financial crisis and Eurozone crisis. Then we somehow addressed the issue. We are better off right now. We are more resilient, better prepared for this type of crisis. And when we thought, now we will, you know, so to say, fine, we're done with that. Then the Russian aggression came in 2014 vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, which has challenged the whole, you know, the whole order we have established after 19, 
after 1990. And they, this was an attack on a, on a direct neighbor of, of Slovakia, which is questioning once again the whole, whole order in, 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 in Europe. So response was there. Uh, then the migration crisis came, which is, you know, which has challenged almost everything. I mean, politically, because we were una unable to deal with such a big wave of migrants coming to, uh, to Europe, we are struggling with that uh, until now. And, you know, when, when we somehow took control of it and we thought, okay, after Russian aggression, after Eurozone crisis and migration, then the Brits organized a referendum in, in, in 2016. I, rem I remember that. And we, we are dealing with that until, until the very moment we were speaking right now. We are not done with that. With that. So what I want to say, difficult decade, a lot of issues that we need to deal with as a sort of say leftovers from that difficult decade. Um, we need, before we start discussing uh, our future, we need to deal with those issues and find the recipe how to deal with migration together, because, you know, it's just a question of time when the next wave, came, wave comes. Uh, we need to still complete the, the governance of the whole Eurozone, uh, definitely. We need to do something again with uh, in, in our neighborhood, with Ukraine, with southern neighborhoods, so foreign policy, foreign policy issues. And of course, a lot will depend on how we how we will be able to respond to COVID. So I start I, I started with you know uh, with my with uh, basically by, by stressing uh, that we are completely consumed by by COVID, but people will, and I will finalize by that, finish by that, to a large extent, people will now um, um, either establish or reestablish trust or further lose the trust with the European Union um, based on how we deal with COVID when it comes to protecting the health, but also how to lead the European economy out, out of, uh, out of the, the crisis. On top of it, uh, of course, and that's also part of the difficult decade, there were, there, were, there were fractions, there were cracks within the European Union, and many have been talking in recent years about the East-West divide. And two, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased uh, once again that we have found a solution today when it comes to budget and rule of law. And I said, rule of law is the, the very basic principle um, that we, uh, the, on which we are building our societies in, in, in the democratic West, if you want. But two, it is a, is, is a fundamental principle for the European Union. So it, is, it has not become so to say, a victim of, of a difficult negotiations. It remains in the center of, uh, of, the, of the whole uh, undertaking or the whole effort of, of European, uh, European Union. So difficult. Uh, we need to address issues which we have inherited from the previous decade of crisis. But we have to now focus all our forces to uh, an effort on how to deal with COVID. If we manage this, I dare say, then people will, uh, will even more uh, identify the irreplaceable, irreplaceable role and power of, of European, of European uh, Union. There are many, many other issues. I'm, I'm ready to talk about that, but this is how I see it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's um, the issue of, of good governance and response to, to COVID-19 is, is impacted a number of governments, um, dare say, impacted political races, spaces like Belarus, which we, we didn't get right. a chance to talk about. But I know you've been quite vocal uh, about uh, concerns about uh, what's taking place in Belarus to Belarusians who've been in who are being, uh, you know, who are being attacked or you know, put in jail. But <clears throat> I wanted to just go back to this because I we have several questions that came in, <clears throat> and interesting within the within the the thread of these questions is the issue of democracy. Mm -hmm. It's um, also about um, your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not lost. Um, 
particularly here to who was blocking the, the, uh, the way forward um, and sort of challenging the issues of rule of law within the EU. And so several of the questions is sort of asking how to address, how, how, would you, how are you thinking about approaching and how should the EU approach this issue of what many, some see as democratic backsliding, um, others see even in the periphery um, outside externally of authoritarians like Lukashenko. And how should, um, how should that be addressed? It comes back to this idea of this democracy summit, which I think is a great idea to try to, it's, it's a great concept, very difficult because there are countries that may be, you know, who are considered to be in the community of democracies right now, but, you know, that may not meet that criteria. And we saw that play out in the EU. So I guess a question to you that came through in several questions, threads was how should, you know, how can you, and I understand that COVID is the immediate challenge. There's no doubt that it can take place but this post-COVID world really um, is going to be about what you said, political West, which is underlined by the strength of democracy as a, as a key component or, or value. And so I think, I, I think all of these questions coming in are sort of asking about that response and you know, what you would see as maybe steps that could be taken. And do you think that there's a role for the United States when it comes to uh, to strengthening democracy uh, in Europe? Is there a role for the United States to play? Um, some mm -hmm. would charge that maybe the last four years, it's been a little bit more about dividing Europe rather than strengthening the EU. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things, but, but it's because all these questions tend to go in this one direction. So um, I know they're not easy answers uh, but or easy to parse, but, um, but I think it's important because I think you touched on all of these topics uh, in your initial and in opening statement. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, I mean, very, very complex issue. Number one, what I'm going to say is um, this is my view of, of a Slovak foreign minister. You will not hear me teach others about what they should be doing within the European Union. It's, it's up to their citizens, as it was for Slovak citizens, to give a strong mandate to the government I'm, I'm representing when it comes to rule of law. So that's why, in fact, the whole, the whole mandate of this government that I'm, I'm representing is about, to a large extent, about restoring trust into state institutions, and especially when it comes to judiciary. This, this has been a problem uh, in, in Slovakia. So, in fact, when, when you're asking me about what needs to be done within the European Union, my immediate question, my, my immediate response is first, we need to deal with that nationally. So it's up to everyone to look at how, how we rule our societies. What, what's, the, what's the type of, well, not what's the type, but, you know, we have to make clear that the um, democratic governance has no alternative with all its components. Rule of law, without rule of law, everything is nothing. And I believe, I believe after 30 years of uh, life in democracy after 1989, we have reached a point where I believe we are losing a bit, a little bit, the battle of narratives of, around democracy. People, as if people, I mean, that's the failure of us uh, politicians, not being able to explain in a very plain and clear language what democracy means for them. Because very often we are rather teaching people about democracy in, you know, in theoretical terms. We have to explain to people that without democracy and rule of law, there will not be prosperity. There will not be jobs. Because if somebody wants to invest money within Slovakia or from outside, and you don't have certainty about independence of judiciary, you will not invest that money. So I believe we need to strengthen uh, also, so to say, our communication with our own citizens nationally about democracy. You've asked about 
or some of our, our those who are listening and, and, and looking at this, what European Union can do. I mean, we can barely expect that it will be European institutions that will, so to say, spread democracy <laughs> if, I, if I overdo it a little bit. It's a national, primarily national role, uh, but, but we've seen it now with the difficult negotiations about budget and, and rule of law. In European Union, uh, we must make clear that rule of law is something that is, that is keeping the nations together. It is not, it, it, it would be ridiculous if we would have a problem of agreeing on a budget because of a disagreement on, on rule of law. I mean, there must not be any question about commitment of us Europeans on European level to, to, the, to the rule of law. Whether I see a role for, for the United States uh, when it comes to this, well, I mean, of course I do. I, 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 do, I do see a role uh, of, of the United States because the US has been, so to say, a beacon of, uh, of, of democracy in terms of a very, very strong appeal and very strong um, leadership in, in, in that sense. And I believe, once again, globally, globally, all democracies have been put under pressure when it comes to our governance. And therefore, this appeal of democracy to democracy must become part of our transatlantic, transatlantic agenda. If the stronger the rule of law in our societies, the better we will be able to deal with challenges worldwide. Because in my view, rule of law is the only way to prosperity and economic power, if you want. And we need economic power to prepare our societies and our countries for uh, challenges in, in the areas, you know, like defense and new threats and so on and so on. So I am I'm absolutely convinced of a need to recommit ourselves once again to this case of, uh, of democracy. Thank you for that. And I think there's this is going to be a recurring theme that you're going to be asked about uh, over the next several months. But I think a lot of a lot of people in Washington are actually looking at Bratislava, are looking to you as well because of uh, of the work that's been done on rule of law internally and sort of the messaging on on this issue. And so I think that there will be a lot of a lot of interest in how to work together uh, with with uh, your government, you and others, uh, I expect that will be a big part of the conversation over the next several weeks and months. But can I ask you just on the, on, you know, you started to mention, um, you know, some of these, um, the deep foreign policy challenges, Russia came up, mm -hmm. um, China is obviously something yeah. when we talk about, you know, global powers, global, global power competition, and, um, you know, it's not lost that you signed a, that, that you signed this joint declaration on 5G yeah. security with Secretary Pompeo. Um, maybe some, some thoughts about sort of the approach to both. And I think what you said earlier, everything you said sort of correlates to building a, a strategy that enables the West, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, the United States, Europe, the EU, Slovakia and others to be able to deal with these global challenges. Um, so you answered part of it, but maybe just tie it together because Russia is um, is is a challenge right now. We you touched a little bit on Belarus, which I hope you might just yeah. say a few few seconds on sort of the approach to to that very difficult issue. You highlighted your obviously your uh, the border and connection to uh, to Ukraine uh, as well. Uh, sort of the most immediate neighborhood challenges. Can you maybe right. just talk talk about um, about Russia and China mm -hmm. and this approach? Um, and, and, and maybe some advice too, because that the 5G issue for me highlights, you know, one of these very difficult issues on economic, on the economic side of what the U S is and the EU are doing together, mm. um, based on, on, on economic cooperation projects, three C's initiative, for example, um, as a, as a counterbalance to, uh, you know, what, but when he sees sort of blind economic engagement from Beijing or from, or from mm -hmm. Moscow. Yeah. So touch on that, please. All right. Um, 
Could, could I maybe start just with, with Belarus? Uh, because I have experienced a very, very interesting uh, situation back in Slovakia that, that, yes, so many were surprised by my clear language where I, where I very, very boldly have been advocating a strong response nationally and European Union vis-a-vis vis -vis regime of, of, of Lukashenko. This is exactly the moment where we have to show to our neighbor, because Belarus is our neighbor, it's, it's our east neighborhood. This is a direct neighbor of a few countries in, in European Union. That it is uh, absolutely unacceptable uh, to see that people are being, you know, oppressed and arrested because they're doing exactly what Czechs and Slovaks and others have been doing in 1989. And I'm, you know, this is this this is our duty, uh, in fact, of us East Europeans to speak up so clearly about about uh, about Belarus. I believe it's just a question of time when people of Belarus will be freed. And uh, it's, for, it's, it's for them to decide who will be their leader. We're not telling them that they should join European Union or, I don't know, the West. No, 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 we're not doing that. We just want to help them um, live, in a, live in a society where they will, where they will be freely choosing their, their leader. That's all about that case that, uh, that is so important uh, for us and to make clear to them that we are not abandoning them. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, Belarus. And by the way, could I say as well, I would expect that Russia would, so to say, which has a special relationship with uh, Belarus, would, would also use its influence vis-a-vis -vis Minsk uh, and try to make clear to them that the, that the level and uh, range of of uh, oppression that it is taking place in in Belarus is not accept is not acceptable. That is a I see it as a as a positive momentum for Russia to to talk to them and engage with uh, with Lukashenko because they have an uh, influence. They have leverage. So this is uh, I believe I believe also something where I would see a role for for Russia. Speaking about uh, uh, about Russia and China, of course, it's completely different. Uh, but to uh, speaking on behalf of, of Slovakia, my point of departure, if you want, my my and our foreign policy doctrine is is to strive for good relationship with everybody. So I'm my starting point is not when it comes to Russia, nor is it when it comes to China. A hostile relationship. I have I I have no ideology of you know sort of or the perspective of somebody who per se is an enemy. No, this is not the case. We want to have a good relationship with both uh, China and and Russia. Two, when it comes uh, to Russia, for example, we see it um, on the one hand as a set of partner not only bilaterally, but also when it comes to many important, important uh, issues uh, of global agenda, where Russia is part of Security Council, Russia is, is definitely a partner we have to talk with about many issues. But two, I'm speaking very openly about divergences and differences um, when it comes also to how Russia sees NATO. NATO for us is the most important organization when it comes to our defense, while Russia sees NATO as a threat. So, I mean, you have diverging, diverging issues, but that does not prevent us from talking to, to each other. Uh, China, uh, I, I'm very pleased that, by the way, also thanks to uh, President Biden's uh, very clear position vis-a-vis -vis China, we in Europe have understood that we, we need to pay attention to China as a rising power and they, therefore, I think we have established back in 2019 in our strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, how we view this uh, huge power. It's again, a, pa a partner in, in many areas, including climate, uh, by the way. It's a, it's a competitor when, 
you know, in in the economic uh, area and trade. It's a it's a very bold competitor. And number three, it's a systemic rival. I mean, th this is obvious because there is a difference when it comes to governance. There is a difference when it comes how we see human rights. And I, as a as a foreign minister, I am the one who says partner, absolutely yes. Yet at the same time, I'm very clear when it comes to to issues of, of human rights, which are of our concern. So Russia, uh, China, uh, Belarus, and maybe lastly about 5G, people are interested. Uh, well, definitely, and, and, and very briefly, we pay critical attention to this critical infrastructure that we are building uh, in, in Slovakia uh, right now. In parallel, and also thanks to, uh, to let's say, intensity with which the outgoing U.S. administration has been reminding us of a need to pay attention to the security part of it. I believe uh, in Slovakia and Europe, we understand that, yes, it is important to look at the security framework uh, around uh, 5G. That was the motivation for me as well to sign the bilateral memorandum when I was uh, in, in Washington DC uh, at the end of October, because it, it, it does include the very principles of our approach to 5G and its security dimension. I have the memorandum here, I can quote from that. Yes, it matters, you know, uh, for national security when building 5G, whether the network hardware and software, I'm quoting from that, suppliers are subject without independent judicial review to control by a foreign government. It does matter whether the network hardware and software suppliers have transparent ownership. It does matter whether the network hardware and so on, innovation and respect for intellectual uh, uh, property rights is ensured. And you can continue. I'll finish that by saying that our approach to 5G security uh, is to preserve our sovereignty when it comes to the decision as who will be supplying important parts of a, of a future 5G infrastructure. So it's not primarily excluding, but rather how to establish a national framework, national legislation through which we can seriously assess what impact it will have when, you know, company or corporation A or B will supply parts of, of, of a future 5G network in Slovakia. It's a matter of national sovereignty. Uh, on that just point, it, do you see this sort of this strategic pledge or joint declaration is something that 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 is shared you know we, some of the questions coming in to ask about asked about Europe writ large um, I did want to say too one of the questions came in from um, one of the congressional offices in Washington highlighting that that Congress um, I think it was Congresswoman Kaptur and others have introduced legislation to fund help support and fund and work with uh uh, you know, counterparts, whether they be in Europe globally on this issue, um, and that the U.S. should, should uh, you know, bring to the table resources. Um, but I wanted to just ask about Europe, and then I just want to do this. I know your time is really short. We, we, yeah. went, we went a little bit over. So what I wanted to do is, and I, I apologize for everybody, we won't get to all the questions, but maybe just ask, you know, maybe respond to the, the 5G sort of Europe, because I, I expect that the next administration coming in is also going to be focused on this. And then maybe just a last word for you on, on you know, on, um, you know, sort of any, any last points that you think that, that are important to raise in this conversation. And I know you have to go, uh, yeah. but we, appreci we greatly appreciate your time. Well, uh, Europe and, and 5G, uh, it's, it's again, it's, a sh it's in a way shared responsibility. While we of course are taking uh, decisions on a, on a national level, how we build the, the, the infrastructure and so on and so on. But two, I very much applaud us, the European uh, Union, for establishing what we call a toolkit, security toolkit, which basically establishes a le legislation 
with the specific elements that we nationally uh, have to apply when scrutinizing uh, future suppliers of uh, this critical infrastructure. I believe this is a, this is a strength. The, by the way, the regulatory power of, uh, of us uh, Europeans, the fact that the European Union does have a legislative power, uh, this is a very, very important element that we should be using much, much more in our transatlantic relations when really trying to focus on how to uphold the West because together, I mean, with the United States and European Union with its regulatory power, where we can together set global standards instead of allowing others to set it for, for ourselves. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, something that I believe has to become a very, very uh, important part of our US, United States, EU relationship for which I'm, I'm, I'm calling, I've been calling for that for, for many, many years and now I, I see a good opportunity. So, at the end of, of, my, uh, of my conversation, and I thank you once again, GMF, for, for allowing me that, uh, let us work together, let us talk together, let us recommit ourselves to common purpose. Uh, maybe let us say loudly, once again, what, what has been uh, so self-evident over the decades, but has almost evaporated over the years, namely, com namely commitment to rule of law and liberal or rules-based, whatever, uh, international order. If we are aware of this in our minds, then I believe we will be better off when trying to deal with very difficult issues, which will, you know, uh, come up on, on our agenda. Trade, extremely difficult and divisive and sensitive. The, so to say, our European effort to be more independent in many issues, strategic sovereignty or autonomy, whatever, those are divisive issues. But that is why, once again, at the outset of this um, attempt to strengthen transatlantic relationship, we need this reassurance once again. What is the common cause uh, for us? Well, I just wanted to, 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 first of all, to thank you. And I think you, I think your last point is one that uh, I know for, for GMF, we're, we're, we're deeply thankful that, that you could join us uh, for this conversation and also to be gracious to stay a little bit extra over time. And I know you're really busy. So uh, dealing with a number of very challenging domestic issues um, and then also European and then global. So thank you so much. And we also want to thank those who participated who joined uh, you know, from the audience. I apologize for not getting to everybody's questions, uh, but we'll have other opportunities, I hope, in the future. And also a special thank you to, uh, also to Karen Donfried uh, for opening up this conversation. Also, uh, Minister, to your colleagues in Washington who've been extraordinary in helping pull this, pull this together. We thank you so much again. We look forward to our next conversation. I'm hopeful that we can do this uh, that we'll all be able to do these, uh, to, to be able to host you in person in, in Washington, or maybe at the next Brussels Forum uh, when that takes place. Pleasure. But uh, but really best wishes to you and also to uh, those that are impacted by COVID um, and looking forward to the next opportunity to, to cooperate and to hear from you um, and have a great rest of your day and a, and a good weekend as well. You're, 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 you're at the end of your day. We're just at the beginning of our day in Washington. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Karna. Before we uh, before we stop with all that, you know, this is excellent paper. Congratulations, GMF. You've inspired inspired me a lot. Excellent, you know, uh, group of people, and really very worthwhile uh, source of inspiration. So a bit advertisement to all those who are watching us and listening to us. Stay safe. Good health to all of you. It was my pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody have a good rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.